if the next uh, presenters are ready, Dries Dams, I thought you were, I, I, I think I'm pronouncing your name completely wrong. <laughs> um, are you there? Yeah, yeah, I'm here. Yes, and okay. That was perfectly fine, by the way. Okay, all right, perfect. And then, so if you like, I would say you can start. Um, Perhaps first, yeah, it's, it's your stage and you have 15 minutes. Um, I will write you the last five minutes, okay? Okay, I will try my very best um, to stay within time. Um, Anglos, you'll have to stop sharing your screen though before I can oh, share. Oh, sorry. Uh, There we go. You should be able to see that. Okay, great. Then I will start a timer on my own. There we go. So thank you all for being here today. Um, I will talk a bit about our ongoing research on simulating resource exploitation um, in Iron Age to Hellenistic communities in Southwest Anatolia. This is a uh, very much ongoing research, um, which has been unfortunately delayed due to various reasons, one of which, of course, is the, the pandemic. And I promised to tell my um, collaborator, Steph Bogers, that all the other reasons were related to me, basically, uh, for which I apologize to him, of course. Um, but yeah, so we are uh, in progress and process of, um, of conducting this research and I will present um, the outline and already some preliminary results. So just to um, very briefly situate the um, general theoretical framework in which we um, embed this re research, um, we generally consider resource exploitation as part of the most general level of flows of energy and resources between society and nature. So that means that um, that means that we consider um, resource exploitation as one of the most direct forms of a society's impact on, on their environment, um, and that um, for resource exploitation to be um, to be sustainable, we need to have some form of organization or strategy that. Um, considers that the, um, the exploitation rate can never exceed the regeneration rate of these resources. Um, so with that being said, um, let's dive directly into um, the archaeological case study. So we're working on a site called Sagalassos, located in southwestern Anatolia. Um, we have here the site itself, um, on which most of our uh, excavations have been focused. Uh, but besides that, we also have a 1,200 square kilometer study region, which we, which more or less coincides with the territory of Sagalassos in Roman imperial times, and which we've uh, explored mainly um, through extensive and intensive archaeological surveys, um, as well as some interdisciplinary research, um, such as um, drilling for pollen cores, sedimentary research, and uh, geomorphological research. Um, so our archaeological background, let's say, um, we focus mostly here on settlement patterns from Iron Age to Hellenistic times. And the Iron Age uh, settlement pattern is mostly characterized by a strong nucleation of settlement, uh, settlement organization in a limited number of um, generally fortified sites located on, a, on higher altitudes, so um, generally subsumed under the moniker of hilltop sites. Um, and this pattern that starts in, in the Iron Age basically continues into the Achaemenid period. Um, and it's only, so in the Achaemenid period, was, which is also the time when Sagalassos first uh, emerged, and it's only in Hellenistic times that we see a first very strong um, change in settlement patterns with not only a strong increase in settlement numbers, but also um, the first emergence of Sagalassos as the primary center in the area um, on a political and uh, economic level. So this, this change, the, or let's say the rise of this, this hilltop uh, dominated settlement pattern in Iron Age times, coincides with um, the onset of what is called the Beishehir occupation phase, 
which is a phase of environmental change characterized by rather warm and humid circumstances, which allowed um, agricultural and uh, arboricultural production at higher altitudes. So this is something that would have facilitated the rise of um, human occupation on higher altitude locations. Um, it's important to note, though, that a lot of the effects of the Beijing occupation phase on the environment is a result of human-induced environmental change. So uh, we know this because the onset of this phase of uh, environmental change is very much different in various um, valleys within the area um, and also beyond our immediate uh, research area. We see this uh, phase occurring in very different uh, time periods. And that's something of a problem, um, especially for us, because we have no um, direct independent proxy for um, climate change or environmental change in the Sinasas area. So what we have are direct proxies um, originating from more distant sources, such as here, the Lake Salda um, isotope signals and the Lake Nar isotope signals. And we have indirect proxies from our area based on the pollen signals from the Valley of Gravgas and the Valley of Bereket in the area. And when we compare these, it's very clear that the changes in climate uh, in Anatolia is not uniform, nor in time, nor in space which means that different parts are influenced by different um, uh, environmental factors. Um, and this is, of course, something that we have to take into consideration when we, when we look into the environmental changes in our area. So we see things changing in the landscape from Iron Age times onwards, but the problem is that we don't have the resolution to explore the how or why. So some other research that we've done on uh, human impact on the landscape, um, consisted of a geomorphological model that was used to simulate the impact of changes in vegetation cover, climate, and uh, hill slope properties um, that was then coupled to a crop yield model to explore the effect of soil thickness on agricultural production. And what we see is that um, the average soil thickness in um, the area, which is um, focused here on one of the valleys, but which can be used as a proxy for a wider um, process, we see that the overall soil thickness is rather stable through time, but that there is a decrease on uh, soil, slopes, uh, soil thickness on the hill slopes, whereas, of course, um, which is induced by um, human, human factors, um, mostly related to um, the um, deforestation practices and the resulting erosion patterns, but that these erosion patterns result in sedimentation of soils in the lower valley slopes. Interesting though, even though the soil thickness in general stays quite stable, it has a quite pronounced impact on the total productivity of these areas, um, which is um, the result of um, the very fact that as soon as you go beyond a certain threshold of soil thickness, um, the soil itself becomes nearly useless. So um, before this human change, uh, this human induced change occurred, there was a kind of stable situation which was disturbed and which was very difficult to remedy. If we look at the uh, signals of the pollen uh, course, then we see that um, from the Iron Age onwards, the um, anthropogenic indicators uh, of uh, plant species start to increase very strongly. Um, and barring a small decrease here in early Hellenistic times, stays rather high um, throughout um, periods until mid-Byzantine times, which is an indicator of very strong human impact in this area. Um, so in short, our uh, data shows quite significant uh, human impact on the environment from the Iron Age onwards. However, we don't know much about the underlying drivers or um, or which uh, flows of energy and resources were affected. Um, an additional hindrance is that under the current regulations, it's very difficult to actually start excavating these um, communities or these, these, these kind of sites. And um, that the information that we have of these from our uh, survey uh, activities is rather limited. So we chose to go an alternative route and to focus on computational modeling, more specifically agent-based modeling, to test the hypotheses that these hilltop sites um, may be considered like one of the major drivers of environmental change 
um, in this period. And we focus specifically on the role of resource exploitation. Um, on the one hand, foodstuffs as a general agricultural production proxy, and on the other um, hand, raw materials for production and construction, uh, more specifically wood and clay. So we started with embedding a um, realistic GIS uh, environment, um, one being a base map of um, fertility uh, in the area, which uh, represents the tons of barley per hectare and year of maximal yields in the area, which is based on modern data, I should uh, note, but which already clearly shows that production is quite uh, highest here in the lowest valleys and um, quite significantly lower on the higher altitudes, which is of course interesting because we know that um, the hilltop sites were all located on a rather on the higher altitude areas. However, if we um, if we look into the oh, sorry, if we look into the um, forest productivity map, we see that um, here we see the inverse, where higher altitudes have actually higher um, forest productivity. So um, there is a um, better or a higher forest productivity at higher altitudes with an with an optimum around 1800 to 2000 meters above sea level. We also implemented, um, so these re resource layers are considered the base layers of our model, and um, these will provide the background for our resource exploitation strategies. We also implemented a um, certain uh, models for the regrowth and the regeneration of our resources. Um, I won't go into detail, but very um, briefly, we um, introduced the logistic growth model for our crops, uh, crop regeneration, and the so-called Chapman-Richards equation for um, to model forest growth, which basically um, says that the um, full regeneration of a um, of a mature forest takes in between 150 and 200 years. We then um, used real settlement locations from our archaeological database as the home basis for our model communities and implemented these in a friction map based on slope and uh, toddler's hiking function to delineate the areas that these um, communities would be able to effectively exploit. Um, so we used the uh, model of John Bindliff um, that he proposed for Iron Age to classical uh, Greece where he states that cultivated areas would be at most uh, about 30 minutes walking distance away from the community. Whereas for woodland areas, we assumed a maximum walking distance of about one hour. And here we already see that of course, differences in altitude has uh, quite the impact on the, uh, the extent of mobility that is possible for such a, a community. The black dots that you see in the background are um, at the moment randomly generated clay sources which are available for communities to, to explode, exploit. Um, just some very brief preliminary results. Um, so at the moment we have a model which um, works by um, exploiting agricultural uh, fields for half of the year and in the other half of the year um, we have our agents which are uh, mostly households um, collect wood and clay. Um, and just to compare here the harvests of crops versus woods, we see um, we selected four communities, one, the, um, two that are located in the valley, two in the mountains, and two that are isolated. That means that they don't have a competitor for their resources in their immediate environment, and two which, uh, which do have competitors around. And we already see some quite interesting results. Um, for example, that um, for the harvest of crops, it's very clear that the location is uh, most important, being that our valley communities have the highest crops, uh, crop harvests um, going on, whereas the impact of the mountainous areas is uh, quite pronounced, and that the effect of having competitors isn't that important in the end uh, for the model at this point, but the altitude is, um, this community is uh, one of our highest, I think, Kepescalesi, I'm not sure, um, but which has quite low agricultural productivity, actually. Um, and it's interesting to see that for wood, we see the inverse, um, whereas the, where the, the mountainous communities are the most productive ones, but interestingly here, 
the effect of competition is much more pronounced. So the um, the mountainous community that is has no co direct competitor um, strongly outperforms uh, one that has uh, competition going on. So which is already quite a, an interesting result. Um, of course, this is only a very um, first implementation of our model. So we are already happy to see that um, there is that there are still um, some interesting results coming forward. But we need to um, extend our model in several different ways. Of course, um, one will be that we will um, try to implement um, a trade-off system between the distance and the energetic costs and returns of resource exploitation. Um, which we hope to be, or which we will base on um, the exploitable territory model um, pr um, proposed by Dean Arnold, um, in which um, there are different costs and returns of exploiting various resources, resulting in um, differential spatial extents of um, profit profitable zones of exploitation. Um, we also want to implement some form of community interaction. So for now, there is co competition between communities, but not they don't interact with each other. There's no um, direct repercussion for getting resources that are part of one or the other's community's uh, hinterland. So that's something we need to implement. Then, of course, towards the end, we, we aim to validate um, our model against some of our socioecological indicators, including, including erosional patterns, um, human impact uh, indicators, and uh, our settlement patterns. So I thank you very much. If you have any questions or comments, we'll be happy to take them either now or later on and do get in touch uh, if you want to talk about this some more. Thank you very much. Thank you very much also. Um